I uh, left Leeds in 84 and uh, went on and I've, I've sort of had a number of careers. I have a career first of all as a university manager, administrator. Then I moved to become a, an academic teaching and researching the university, university management. And gradually, gradually I've, I've sort of found my way back. My first degree, my PhD are in history. I've found my way back into history. Um, and in a way, my two great loves have come together. Higher education, universities, and, and history. Um, and that's taken me to where I am now, which is increasingly focused on study of the history of higher education. Um, and you might say, what's a historian of higher education doing in a management school at the University of Liverpool? Uh, and that's a very good question. Um, sometimes I'm not quite sure myself, but anyway. Uh, that's how it is. Um, so as Matt said, I'm doing a, a um, book at the moment, uh, coming out of the new year, about uh, the impact of the First World War on British higher education. So what I want to do tonight, uh, I'm going to say a bit about just what I'm doing, the sort of project. Then I want to talk a little bit about the financing, funding of higher education sort of in 1913-14, just on the eve of the war. Talk a bit about what happened during the war. Um, and there's sort of two clear phases. Um, there's a phase from sort of 1914 to 1916, which was very much crisis, uh, crisis management. And then the second half of the war was much more looking to the, looking to the future. So I want to discuss both of those sides, those, those aspects, and then I want to talk about some of the legacy, um, how some of those changes that came about during the war actually had a long-term impact. So, the main project I'm working on at the moment, which is funded by a grant from the Society for Research in Higher Education, uh, is looking at the impact of the First World War on British higher education. Um, I'm quite sort of proud of this. Um, SRHE um, fund quite a lot of <coughs> research in higher education. Up until this, they had never funded a historical project. It was all policy matters, uh, educational issues, pedagogic issues, these sort of things. Uh, but they decided they would back my proposal, which I'm very was obviously delighted about. So what I'm doing is looking at the impact of the war and all, lots of different areas that that covers. It's made up of a whole series, really, of of, little, of case studies of individual institutions. They're listed there: Aberdeen, Bristol. Cardiff, which at the time was the College of South Wales and Monmouthshire, uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Kings, London, Leeds, uh, Liverpool, uh, Newcastle, which was Armstrong College at that time, part of the University of Durham, uh, Oxford, Sheffield, Southampton, which was a university college at the time. All sorts of sources, uh, Senate Council papers, various committee papers, finance committee papers, these sort of things. Uh, annual reports, miscellaneous correspondence. Also doing quite a lot of work, and this is where, in some ways, the work is is quite distinctive. Um, many of the there there are histories of a lot of these universities and other universities, but they tend to be sort of vertical histories. Uh, you know, they're the history of the University of Liverpool from 1881 to the present day. Uh, or the, you know, there is a history written by Peter Gosden um, some time ago which relates to the history of the University of Leeds. But there's very little that cuts across looking more at more themes or issues. And also, the things that have been written tend to be based very much around individual university records. There's a huge amount of unused material in the National Archives in Kew. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work around uh, the Board of Education papers, the Treasury papers at that time. Uh, also looking at newspapers as, as well. So those are the sort of sources that drawing upon as far as the project is, is concerned. So what's coming out of this? Um, various 
themes that uh, I'm sort of working on. Um, there's a whole series of papers sort of in the pipeline on some of this. Looking at just the contribution of the universities during the war, role of, role of volunteering, how universities actually supported communities. One of the themes that I argue for quite strongly in the book is that universities, which had very much been in the shadows, sort of began to emerge and have an impact in their communities during the war for all sorts of different reasons. Talk a lot about students and the student experience, what actually happened to students during the war. The in the sort of tracking some of the changes in student numbers, as we go on to, to look at, student numbers dropped dramatically. Uh, but then actually by the end of the war, we're beginning to edge up again. Um, it's an interesting period for the emergence of new subject areas. Uh, it was a, a period of growing interest, for example, in modern languages. Um, a number of universities uh, established new chairs in different modern languages at the time, uh, especially subjects like Russian. There was a lot of interest in Russia, initially as an ally during the war, and then obviously uh, after 1917 a different sort of interest, but there was real interest in Russia, in Eastern Europe, uh, and also other areas where so Spanish, for instance, a number of chairs of Spanish were set up during the First World War. Interesting that it wasn't really looking at languages for the study of the language or the study of the culture. This was very much seeing the importance of modern languages in support of commerce, in support of business. Um, that was an area itself which began to develop during the war. A number of universities begin to start degrees in commerce. Uh, in what we might call business studies in a way now. Um, but that was another area that developed in the war. Social sciences in other respects developed during the war as well. Uh, the study of a social work, for example, was one that, that a number of universities moved into. And again, you can, it was fairly easy to sort of see why in some senses, because of the demand within society for people who could sort of care for and understood some of the problems that were arising at home in the war. New course structures. You started to see sandwich courses develop towards the end of the war, with people spending some time in business or industry, some time in university. So it was an interesting time of looking at changes, um, and most of them can be tracked back to something that was some sort of consequence of the war. Now, what I'm going to talk about tonight is very much this line here, funding of higher education. So I'll come back to that. That's really tonight's talk. Other themes that the project is covering, lots of changes as far as research is concerned. Research took on a new importance within universities during the First World War. Some of it linked to munitions and armaments and so on, but other things looking at, the con again, the, the sort of consequences of war. So... Uh, quite an interesting example was various developments in sort of food science, refrigeration, and so on. Very much developing in this period, and partly linked to the need to preserve food during the wartime. Um, universities <coughs> began to develop new organisational models for how they looked after research. Before the war, research was very, quite low-key in many ways. Uh, universities began to look at it. There was a big push for links with increasing links with business. Uh, government actually set up a Royal Commission during the war time to look at this whole, whole area. And very interesting sort of documents begin to emerge about um, you know, sort of things that, that preoccupy universities today, like intellectual property. Um, and there were big discussions going on in sort of 1917, 1918 in many universities about these links with business, well how do we actually manage them? And who actually owns any of the results that come out of this? Um, and these discussions were really quite, quite lively at that time. Also quite lively debates with government uh, about um, tax, tax incentives to go with, with the whole research side of, of universities. You know, issues which you know, have a remarkably familiar sound, actually, today. 
But this was very, very lively sort of at that time. Um, there were also changes in the way universities were managed and, and um, the way they were structured um, to, to cope with a lot of the savings, to cope with a lot of the, these other things. You start seeing a sort of professionalization of university management, university leadership. Um, there were also, it was also an important period as far as academic staffing was concerned. Big issues about salaries, big issues about superannuation, about employment rights. Um, that's another theme that comes out from the project. And also internationalisation. Um, now, you know, it would be wrong to say that universities before the war were not, didn't have some international contacts. Academic staff often did. There were often international students. The University of Leeds here in 1913-14, there was a community of international students. Um, most of them from other empire countries, um, some, from, um, some from other parts of Europe. Uh, but, the, but the war placed a big emphasis on the academic links with other parts of the empire, especially. And linked with that, you see the emergence of the PhD. Uh, PhD introduced into this country in 1917. Um, and it was very, there were big conferences held around about that time among universities with government encouragement. Uh, and the basic question was, you know, before the war, people had travelled to Germany for higher study and so the British universities were wanting to sort of say you know, how do we make sure they come to this country in the future and don't go to Germany in the future um, and the PhD was part of the response to that um, so these are, these are a diverse group of, of themes which emer that are emerging in the, in the work that I'm doing but it's this one here that I'm talking about tonight. Um, the others we can talk about on another occasion. Uh, but it's funding of higher education I want to look at. So let's just just very briefly recap a little bit about what's the what's higher education looking like before the First World War. Well if you look at the sort of 40, 50 years or so before the war it was actually a time of considerable development. There were changes going on, legislation relating to Oxford and Cambridge. Basically, it was legislation that was reducing the power and influence of the church, and was also adjusting the sort of relationship between the colleges and the universities uh, in favour of the universities. Um, ongoing issues. Uh, sort of never been resolved yet. Um, but there, so Oxford and Cambridge were changing. In London, there was a big restructuring going on in London, uh, looking at the relationship between different colleges and the University of London. Um, and part of the sort of um, reason for this was the emergence of Imperial College. You'd had UCL, you'd had University College London, you'd had King's. But at the beginning of the 20th century, you had the emergence also of, of Imperial College. And that sort of drove some of the changes in, in London. Then you had the emergence around the country, in this, very much in the second half of the 19th century, of different university colleges. Um, and I've just thrown in a few of them as, as little examples there. But the, the, these were colleges developing. These were not, they didn't have charters. They were not universities as such at that point. Uh, but they were established as university colleges, many of them delivering teaching that wasn't actually for their own degrees, it was preparing students to sit for examinations in London or in Oxford and Cambridge. 1880, crucial year, interesting one in the Leeds context. Uh, 1880, establishment of the Victoria University, the attempt to set up a, a federal university for the north of England. Uh, and by the end of the 1880s, you had Manchester, Liverpool and Leeds to united as university colleges within a chartered independent university, Victoria University. Um, 
interesting sort of case study in itself. Uh, it all fell apart early in the 20th century, in the first decade of the 20th century, and gave rise to independent universities in Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds. Uh, full of acrimony and bitterness, all sorts of arguments. Uh, basically, Liverpool wanted out, Leeds wanted to hold the thing together, um, but Liverpool opted out, Manchester quickly followed them, and Leeds was left to pick up the pieces. Um, and obviously the name Victoria University survives in the University of Manchester today. So it was a time of, of change. So let's see, what, what did he, what was, I, I, doing this for all of those case studies, but uh, just to look at what was the University of Leeds like in 1913-14. Just over a thousand day students, almost all of them undergraduate, very little in the way of postgraduate study, a few, a few students doing masters, um, but not much. It was, it was almost all undergraduate. Uh, two thirds, roughly, full time students, um, the rest part time. Um, interesting, quite a substantial number of people <coughs> studying on a part time basis. 81% men. Um, but quite significant variations by faculty. So if you'd looked at technology engineering, it would have been almost exclusively male. Um, science, almost exclusively male. Arts, much more 50-50. Um, most of these students were coming from Leeds and the immediate vicinity of Leeds. Um, so. I've done some work looking at actually tracking back to, to where people were, were living and you, know, you, you certainly, it's probably around about 80% of students were local. Local, defining local as Leeds and the West Riding. Uh, and most of them would have sort of commuted in each day for their, for their lectures. The university did have some residential accommodation but not very much. Um, and that was nearly all for male students. It developed some residential accommodation for women around about this time. The ages had some students who were 16 years old. Um, equally, it had quite a large group of students who were over the age of 21. Many of those would have been the part-times. So you had a range of, a whole range of different programmes being studied. Some students was, were studying for Leeds degrees, some were studying for degrees of other universities, London, primarily London and Oxford and Cambridge. Um, some weren't studying for degrees at all. Some were just studying on a sort of non-award basis. Um, then, over and above this, there was a major commitment to other forms of, of, of higher education extension classes, evening courses, preparations for professional examinations. Um, large numbers of students engaged in those sort of activities as well. Now that's just a little picture of Leeds, but you could reproduce that picture in, certainly in all of the civic universities. Oxford and Cambridge would have looked a little bit different, um, but Certainly, among all the other universities, that would have been a very familiar picture. Primarily undergraduate, uh, primarily male, and primarily local. Okay, so what does funding look like before the war? Now that's University of Liverpool. I could have given you University of Leeds, uh, but that's University of Liverpool. And what you'll see is actually a fairly sort of even, you know, there's quite a, a, a diverse range, but quite sort of well split up in a, in, in a way. Um, so this chunk here, about 20, 26%, well, just over a quarter of total income at that time, fees, academic fees. Fees at that time were very complicated. You didn't just pay one fee, you paid multiple fees. 
You paid fees for tuition. You paid fees for examinations. You paid l laboratory fees. If you were in a science subject, you would have paid extra fees. Very, very complex fee structure. Some of those fees went straight to the academic staff. They were part of the salary. The salary for academic staff could, go, could vary according to actually how many students they attracted and paid fees to study in their classes. Another quite big chunk, endowments. Endowments, donations, um, yeah, that's, that's a quarter. An interest on endowments was very significant. And income came in other respects as well. Dating back to when the university colleges were established, people subscribed. Universities had subscribers. So people in the community paid an annual amount to support their local university. Um, and certainly in the period up until the First World War, this was still an important, back in the, in the, in the 1880s, 1890s, it's been very significant indeed, but it was still an important area. So end endowments, interest on endowments, donations were very important. Now this is an interesting chunk here. It's 14% at Liverpool. It varies in different universities. It can be anywhere between about 10% and 20%. And that's local authorities. That's Leeds City Council giving money to the university to run the university. It's West Riding Council giving money to the university as a grant to run the university. And the local authorities at that time were important funders of higher education. I'm not just talking about scholarships and so on, these were grants given to the university to support the running of the university. That chunk there is government money, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and then there's just other, other sources that come from... Um, universities were remarkably entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, don't, don't run away with the idea that the entrepreneurial university is, a, is just a sort of a creation of the last 20 years or so. Leeds and the other universities, you know, they never lost a trick in terms of trying to generate some income. Uh, you know, local, some fascinating correspondence, you know, with local societies and so on, and local bodies who wanted to use a room, and then the, the university would charge them a certain amount, and they'd say, oh, that's too much, and, and the university would hold its ground, and so they oh, you know, we, you know, we're going to charge you the full amount, and so on. <coughs> um, you know, universities were very, very uh, adept at charging for anything they could at that time. Um, there's nothing new in that. Um, and so you know, there's another chunk of income. Now, that's Liverpool. Most, again, with the possible exception of Oxford and Cambridge, most universities <coughs> would have looked very similar. So the thing I really want you to keep in your mind is that over a quarter of income is coming from student fees. Because that makes the university vulnerable at the, at the outbreak of war. Okay, so that's income. What about expenditure? This is Edinburgh. But again, the picture is very similar. Big chunk here. Well over, over half of the total expenditure. Staffing, salaries, academic staff, professors. That over half on staffing expenditure. Then a whole range of other, other things which include uh, bits and pieces for maintenance, departmental running costs, library costs and, and so on. Uh, but the thing that I want to look in your mind is this one. Staff expenditure. So 1913, 1914 we have universities with a high dependence on fees and a high commitment as far as staffing expenditure is concerned. And that means that they are vulnerable to change. 
And that is exactly what happens. So just going into that in a little bit more detail, very diverse sources of income. Now, talking about government grant, well actually that wasn't a government grant. Government grants came in all sorts of different forms. I've listed the four main forms there. There were actually lots and lots of little sums of money that were coming from government in different ways. You had what was called the Exchequer Grant, started in 1889. Uh, not given to all universities, it only was for the new universities, which included Leeds and Liverpool and Manchester and Sheffield and so on, but did not include Oxford and Cambridge and did not include Durham. Um, they were the ancient universities. Leeds was a new university at that time. Um, so that was Exchequer Grant, given, started in 1889, fairly low key, fairly low sums of money, and given it was intended to meet certain running costs, certain infrastructure costs. Um, and it was given actually primarily, and this is something we're going to come back to later, primarily it was given as an inducement. It was given to universities to try and encourage them to get other money from other sources. Um, so it was given in, in some way to, to ease the way to local philanthropy, local authority funding and so on. A statement grant also came from the Exchequer, from Treasury, and that was for certain subjects, primarily in engineering and technology. Board of Education gave a separate grant for teacher training. Board of Agriculture gave a separate grant for anything to do with food or agriculture. Um, and Leeds was a bit at that time, big school of agriculture at that time, big beneficiary of that income. Um, put all those together, it was 28% of income at Liverpool, 23% Edinburgh, 26% Bristol. I could give you other figures. Um, fees, so there we are. That was the Liverpool picture we looked at a few minutes ago, 26%. Look at Edinburgh, 38% depending on fees. Then they were getting money from endowments, donations, subscriptions, which are talked about, local authority grants. But the key thing is it's vulnerable to fluctuation. Now, that was fee income into the University of Leeds during the war. So there we are. There's 1913. Nice one. But just look at what happens. That, from there to there, is a big and serious drop in income. It goes back up towards the end of the war, and then big jump forward. 1918-19 was a bit of a funny year because it started in wartime and ended in peacetime, but there were a lot of students who suddenly registered in the second half of that session. But that, in a way, that drop there is the story that I'm really going to focus on. You know, what, what happens? How did they deal with that? How did they manage that? It was a huge shock. They hadn't expected this. Big drops in fee income. So fee income at Liverpool dropped 31%. Now, you know, that's a big drop. Uh, Bristol, it was 22%. Edinburgh, 26%. To and that obviously had consequences for total income. And given that dependence on fixed costs, staffing, um, it meant that they had a financial crisis. So, very, very quickly, August 1914, September 1914, the universities start to worry. And you look at their count, look at council minutes, finance committee minutes, and so on, and very, very quickly, they are worried about what's going to happen. Uh, and worry quickly turns almost to panic. Um, certainly towards the end of 1914, Beginning in 1915, there is, the universities are very alarmed. They immediately start savings. They try and make savings wherever they can. So that, you know, 
immediately there's a sort of freeze put on any filling of staff vacancies. Most universities completely stopped recruiting staff in any way, at all levels. They cut departmental grants. Uh, the sort of grants that were given to academic departments uh, for their their day-to-day -day running costs, to buy equipment, to buy um, sort of chemicals or whatever it might be, those grants were cut immediately. Maintenance on buildings was suspended. New building, so, you know, some universities had new buildings planned or almost ready to go. Uh, Bristol was a classic example of that. If you know the University of Bristol, you'll know the Wills Tower. Well, the Wills Tower should have been built about 10 years earlier than it really was. Um, but it was suspended because of wartime. Um, so, you know, new buildings, maintenance, all suspended very quickly. Uh, teaching it was reorganised. It had to be reorganised. You had that drop in student numbers. You also had many staff going off to, to fight in the war. So classes were brought together. Savings were, were made in the actual delivery of teaching. Interesting debates took place about voluntary salary savings. In a number of universities, many staff actually said, you know, we're willing to take a cut in our salary uh, to, to help the cause, to help the university through this period. And there were some quite interesting and lively debates about this. Uh, some fascinating debates at Oxford, uh, where there were a whole cluster of people wanted to take um, voluntary saving, voluntary salary reductions. Another classic case was Cardiff, where, the, where again, large numbers of staff, including the Vice-Chancellor, offering to take a, a cut in salary. Um, the view of government was government actually didn't want this. Government didn't like this. Government was worried about the impact of salary, salary reductions on morale. Um, and so there's quite a, quite a debate goes on. And in practice, towards the end, actually salary reductions do not take place. But there is a debate about that. OK. Um, I won't go through some of these quotations in, in detail. But that's just to, just to give a little flavour. This is from Liverpool. Um, there's a few key things to sort of point out in some of this without going into any detail. You'll notice things like the council hopes that friends of the university will help it overcome the exceptional difficulties. This is still this returning to their local communities, their local roots, as to you know, where help might be forthcoming. Um, here again, Edward Carey, who's a fascinating character, uh, who was registrar at Liverpool from 1911 to 1937. Um, and a very interesting character. Uh, but he, he was part of the debate at Liverpool about salaries and argued against cutting salaries. Um, but again, what you're, what you're hearing is the university's talking about how, many, how they're trying ever so hard to make savings. Now, so far, they're looking inwards. You know, how do we make savings? Uh, there, was no, there was no sort of instinctive reaction to turn to government. But it did come fairly quickly. And the universities that were actually in the lead, as far as looking towards government funding was concerned, was it were in Scotland. And in, early in 1915, the Scottish universities got together. And there's another interesting point. The university is beginning to work together. War forced them to talk to each other. So those universities that had often been very independent institutions actually were forced by the circumstances of war to start talking to each other. And that happened in a number of areas. It certainly happened in Scotland. Um, and the Scottish universities got together and they sent a memorandum to government and they were basically saying look, we've made all these savings, we can't make any more, uh, we're also 
helping the war effort in all these different ways. Our students have gone to fight in the war. Our staff have gone to fight in the war. Our, our departments are helping in the war effort. Government, you've got to help us to get over these financial problems. Now, that's quite a significant point because suddenly the universities are looking to government for help. They're looking to government for support. Before the war, that wouldn't have been happening. Now, I can't resist a few. We're in the Michael Sadler building, so we ought to have some quotations from Michael Sadler, uh, who was Vice-Chancellor here uh, throughout the war. And you know, he was talking, and this is a quote from uh, 1915, and again, what he's talking about, and this was a growing concern, talks about how, how the universities made savings. Um, you know, interestingly, there's, there's only a small deficit, and that's because of the savings that have been made, and so on. But then he starts talking, and this becomes another theme, about the impact of all of this on the quality of work, of the quality of activities in the university. And starts expressing these sort of concerns. And it's very interesting that he was saying this uh, right at the beginning of 1915. Uh, soon after that, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester and Sheffield and um, Armstrong College combined to sign another one of these memorandum, uh, a bit like the Scottish one, uh, but it was a memorandum from the Northern English Universities and that was saying to government, help us. We're doing all, we're doing all we can but we need help. And the language of the Northern Universities one uh, very much picks up Michael Sadler's points in here, especially about the quality of impact of these financial constraints on quality of teaching. So Michael Sadler was clearly a, a sort of leading light within the, um, uh, in driving that memorandum from the Northern Universities. Now, all of this was going on. So what, what, what was, you know, there was a whole series of debates and discussions in different universities. But it, it starts to throw up some quite interesting questions. Key question, you know, universities were very concerned. You know, how far can we cut without, you know, before it actually has such an adverse effect that something becomes, you know, unrealistic? <coughs> and they weren't sure. They didn't know the answer to that. Um, but that was something they were very worried about. They were worried about, you know, how could they just make sort of savings and then would everything be all right after the war? How could they avoid long-term damage? You know, they, they had no idea about how long the war was actually going on for. Um, so they, they, they didn't know about how to try and minimise the long-term damage. Then there were all these issues about, you know, should you make savings equally? between different universities and within universities between different departments. Lots of questions about, uh, you know, had, were some universities better managed than other universities? And if so, did that mean actually that university should only make a smaller saving than, than a, a, a university that was more sort of profligate and, and, and not so well managed? You started to get these interesting questions into university and comparisons and, and with intra-university comparisons. This question about, you know, was it acceptable to take voluntary contributions? And then, you know, most of the universities had some reserves. Should, is that the first, you know, first port of call? Is that to, to eat into all of your reserves or sell your assets and so on? These were questions that were being debated. So, what then happened? What's, what's, the what's the reaction of government to all of this? Um, now, there was an advisory committee on grants for universities, which was actually part of the Board of Education, but, but actually made recommendations that were sent to Treasury. So it came under the Education Department, if you like, uh, but its, its recommendations were sent to, to Treasury. Um, and... Within that committee, um, 
two, two key characters. The chairman of that committee, Sir William McCormick, uh, and the secretary to that committee, Arthur Kidd. Uh, and their names will appear several times more. But they, very sensitive, they, it was a small system in a way. No, system's the wrong word. It was a small world. They knew individual universities. They knew the position in individual universities. And they were really quite worried about the panic that was setting in amongst the universities. And they felt that government, that says, yeah, there were two options. You, our government either ne needed to give some special financial assistance immediately or leave things to the end of the war. And they argued that some immediate assistance was needed. Uh, that's a long quote, I won't go through that in any detail, but what, what it's really saying, what happened after a lot of sort of argument, uh, £100,000 was set aside by Treasury, that was for the English universities, by the time the Scottish universities, the agricultural colleges, the Welsh colleges and so on were added into all of it, there was a total of £145,000 that Treasury made available. Uh, for a, to be allocated as special grants to help the universities through this crisis. Um, and there were all sorts of discussions about how this should be done, how these sums of money should be allocated. What, these are some of the sort of principles that emerged. Uh, there was this tension between how do you, you know, do you, how do you justify giving the universities this extra money? You know, we're in a war, uh, everybody's making savings and sacrifices. Was it right to be giving something extra to the universities? Even though it was extra to compensate for a, a loss, um, nevertheless, that debate still went on. Um, well, what became very clear was that government started to sort of think along the lines of, well, if we are giving support, this is not just handing over a blank cheque. There are going to be strings attached to this. We want to know how money is going to be spent. We want to know that it's justified. Um, and so you start seeing, again, some important themes that will keep re-emerging. Uh, initially, when McCormick went to Treasury, Lloyd George was Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time. Lloyd George was very supportive. He, wanted, he was quite happy to, to help the universities and give some money to the universities. Uh, he was particularly keen on giving some money to the University of Wales. Um, but things begin to change. When he um, moves from the Treasury, becomes Prime Minister, uh, other voices start to raise their, come, about, come into the debate, who are actually much more concerned. And s there are various documents in Treasury which actually advocate institutional closures. They talk about possible mergers between universities to help them survive, but they also talk about possible closures. McCormick and Kidd move quite quickly to try and get this through before those negative voices take over. And they're successful. In November 1915, a whole series of grants are announced. I've just listed four there that I thought might interest you. Uh, there's Leeds getting an extra £3,500. Um, one-off payment uh, to try and help. The, the idea was a one-off payment to cover the loss of income due to the reduction in fees due to the lack of students. Uh, so Leeds gets three and a half thousand, Liverpool got seven and a half thousand, Manchester five thousand, Sheffield two thousand five hundred. Um, it's, it's interesting, um, but I can remember when I worked here in the late 1970s, there was a strong view, deeply held by some people in the university, that the underfunding of Leeds University went back to the First World War. Now, I'm not not saying I go along with that, I'm just saying there were people around in this university in the late 70s who believed that the relative underfunding of Leeds University <coughs> all went back to this time. Um, interesting further little thing just to throw in, just keep in your, in your mind, 
um, the Committee on Advisory Committee on University Grants uh, said to the Lords of the Treasury that these grants should be contingent upon the grants from local authorities remaining as they were. They did not, they were, they were worried that local authorities might use the war almost as an excuse to stop funding or reduce funding of universities. And so that was made a condition. Okay, so that takes us through until 1915-1916. And some grants have been, have been given. 1617, um, crisis sort of eases. Some universities actually turn in small working surpluses. Um, it's the effect of those special grants taken together with salary savings. Um, you know, as the war develops, even more staff are going off to fight in the war. And what generally happens is that the universities say to their staff, we will guarantee your salary. If you fight if you're in the Army, Navy, the embryonic Air Force, uh, and certain other services, uh, we will guarantee your salary. So what that meant was that if they got sort of a sum of money that was, say, two-thirds of, two of their salary from their government or their military employment, uh, the university would make up the balance. But nevertheless, you often had quite substantial savings as a result. The other big thing that actually, at the beginning of the war, the universities had been worried about, but actually never actually happened. They were worried that some of those other sources of income, especially the interest on endowments and so on, would collapse. It didn't. So, actually other sources remain remarkably constant. They had reserves. So, as I say, some universities were even beginning to show small surpluses. And you have some wonderful stories from some of the vice-chancellors sort of desperately trying to explain why they were making a surplus uh, in a very defensive way, almost embarrassed to be that they had surpluses. Uh, but that's what began to happen. Um, there's a quote from from Leeds. Um, it's an interesting quote. It's talking about, you know, again, um, showing a small, though diminished balance on the right side due to continuance of the economies. Um, but what they're, what they're trying to say here is this isn't permanent. These aren't long-term savings. And actually, you know, they're sort of, you're cutting away the base a little bit in, in terms of, of materials, uh, buildings, and so on. And so, you know, actually there's going to be this big sort of bill to come afterwards. And, and yet again, you still get the university looking towards its friends, by which it really meant its local friends. Um, see, what begins to emerge, 17, 18, is the universities have reached some sort of balance on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. But... You know, buildings are not being maintained. Um, you know, teaching is really at breaking point. Um, and you know, there's very, very, you know, they're facing great difficulties, even if on the surface they're, they're not, it's not looking quite so bad. And this is very much, you know, the people in government, Kidd, McCormick, are very much aware of this and start sort of looking at and start thinking about, well, what are we going to do in the future? So you actually start getting, in 17, 18, universities beginning to wonder about the future, government beginning to wonder about the future. I won't go through that in any detail. There's a few things that, what, what that's really showing is how they made some of these savings. Some of the cuts that were made in administration, some of the cuts that were made in departmental running costs and so on. This is where they... They, this is how they balance the books. Um, you start seeing you know, that the bottom one there, Liverpool expenditure on, on professors, lecturers, teaching staff, fell by 18% over those years. That's how they, that's how they balance the books. Towards the end of the war, things begin to improve. 
It's interesting, there's another source of income which suddenly emerges, 16, 17, and that's very much the training of people to work in the munitions factories. Um, the emerging Air Force suddenly, University of Liverpool got a contract to uh, train technicians to, to work in the Air Force. Uh, things that hadn't sort of been around before the start of the war. So that actually things begin to improve. Okay. So, I, w I w again won't go through the quotes in any, in any detail. But what you, what you see is this sort of sharing of, of views. Both within, you've got the universities saying, okay, we're just about balancing, but we're storing up big problems for the future. You've got people in government acknowledging this and beginning to look to what are we going to do when the war is over. It's one of the things that fascinates me in all of this is that you've got people talking very seriously about what are we going to do when the war is over before many of the great battles of the war had actually been fought. So you know, you've got people, not this particular quote but other ones, going back to 1916 where people are talking about the future. And they're talking about it before the Somme had actually happened. Um, and it's interesting how they were beginning at that point to, to start looking to the future. Kid talks here about some of the things we've touched on already, growth of modern languages, uh, growing public interest in higher education, the need for res new research, the growing recognition of the importance of science and technology and the need for government to support that. <coughs> um, and he talks further about the, the growing importance of, of how universities should re react to some of this. There's one particular quote I want to touch on. There we are. Now, this is coming from government. This is from within the Board of Education. Um, and talking about the sort of you know, the need to provide more money for higher education and so on. But the language begins to change quite significantly. Start talking about a national scheme in which all university education should be included. That was talk that you would not have got before the start of the war, when universities were all very individual and different. And, and really government uh, was kept its distance from universities, but you know, through the war, recognising the importance of the universities in higher education, the language begins to change, and it begins to you start seeing ideas of a system of higher education. You start seeing references to the public good. You wouldn't have got that before the war, or very little. So things are beginning to change. Now, just to sort of highlight a few areas in particular. Within the Board of Education, they start talking about increased maintenance grants. Now, that what they refer to as maintenance grants, that's the, that's the sort of exchequer grant. Uh, that's not payments to students or anything like that. It's money to the, to the universities. And they start talking about needing to increase that. Uh, it would have, the, the old quinquennial scheme would have expired in 1916. That was all put on ice because of the war. Uh, but there was this general acceptance that more money would have to be provided. But again, government was anxious. Government didn't want to replace uh, local authorities. And so there's lots of talk about actually incentive schemes. So, you know, we, government will give a pound if the local authority gives a pound. Um, important, you know, they, they still saw that as an important link. They began to realise the need to provide capital funding for equipment and buildings. That was not given before the war. Um, before the war, hardly any capital funding from any sort of public source. Um, but now... There's this recognition that, that capital funding is needed. And there again is this idea of a national system. Um, you know, uh, 
any scheme for increasing the efficiency and output of university education in this country must be comprehensive and framed on a national basis. This is new. This is a new language. Um, and you know, the needs of different institutions can no longer be dealt with in a piecemeal way, but must be viewed in relation to one another uh, and to the needs and resources of the nation. Um, concern, therefore, about growing ideas about a national system and about maintaining and obtaining efficiencies within them. Um, so in the course of 1918, um, different, lots of discussions going on. As I say, both universities and government begin to realise that something's got to change. Um, 19, summer of 1918, there's a suggestion that there should be a big conference held uh, to sort of thrash these things out. But then, of course, these big debates have to happen. Who actually gets invited to the conference? Um, should it only be the universities that have been getting money from government before the war? That would have excluded Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, was this just the English universities? Should we have the Scottish universities? Should we have the Welsh universities? And even more controversial, should we have the Irish universities, given what was going on in Ireland at the time? Um, so, you know, big, lots of arguments over the summer of 18 about this conference, you know, who should be there. An agenda begins to emerge with four main items of discussion. Increasing remuneration for academic staff, uh, reductions in fees in order to encourage more students into universities. And these things sound remarkably familiar. Um, how should, you know, increasing grants for research activity, especially including capital, capital funding, and how should we make good financial losses in the war? You know, there were ideas, do you just write them off? Or what do you do? So that's the agenda that begins to emerge in the course of 1918. And it all comes to the boil in November 1918, within days of the end of the war. A uh, big conference held in London, attended by all the British universities, but not the Irish. <laughs> um, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer is there, and the President of the Board of Education is there. Big conference. Uh, I think very <coughs> under, underknown and under-recognised in British education history. Um, but it's a big conference. Um, it leads to various commitments from government for increased funding. And perhaps most significant of all, it led directly the following year to the establishment of the University Grants Committee, the UGC, that was going to, in practice, lead British higher education right through until 1988. Um, so, you know, that was, the war ended with this big conference to try and sort things out, various promises given, um, but, you know, in a way, this was the big key thing. That was what McCormick and Kidd had been arguing for. They didn't quite get their way, because they would have liked UGC to have been under the Board of Education. It wasn't, it was under the Treasury. McCormick became the first chair of the UGC, but, it be, it, but the Treasury would not let go of the, of the purse strings. So, just about to finish. A few just final thoughts. Um, you know, what, what, what did the war mean? What did it do for the funding of, of British higher education? Um, no question that you know, universities started the war, really, you know, anything they got from government was a bit of a bonus, a bit of an extra. They ended the war really looking to government for funding, expecting it, dependent upon it. Uh, that was a big shift. Many of the universities were acutely aware of this. Some vice chancellors wrote very eloquently about the dangers in this and the risks in this. Um, they were very much aware that they were losing their independence and losing autonomy, um, and you know that that this was a this was the downside. 
but they didn't see any alternative to it. Um, I talked a little bit about inter-university collaboration. You also, you see, there are lots of meetings held in the war between vice-chancellors, which you wouldn't have got before. You start seeing the increased professionalization <coughs> in management. Uh, you know, universities suddenly had to know how much they were spending on something. They had to look for where savings might be. Um, and start, you start seeing the university registrar, the university accountant, actually taking a slightly higher profile. Many of those positions have been part-time positions before the war. That wasn't going to happen again. And you also start seeing moves towards conformity. So before the war, lots of different fees, lots of different you know, places charging different levels of fee, all for different things. That all starts to be brought together. One of the issues when those special grants were made, one of the problems that the advisory committee faced in trying to work out how much each university should get was the problem that every university at that time had a different financial year. Um, and so trying to compare the, you know, the, the outturns of different universities was virtually impossible. So it's no surprise that actually they start saying that it's got to be more conformity to, to the way universities run themselves. And one of the first things that the UGC does is introduce that. So what, from the side of government, government starts to see the importance of higher education in a way that it had never seen before. Uh, you know, you start hearing people saying that about the importance of how universities have contributed to the war effort, to the victory. Um, and, and government then also starts seeing the importance as far as commerce was concerned. There was this big worry going on in, that, that actually, you know, Britain had been losing out before the war to Germany, to the United States, and we've got to catch that up. And that would require science and technology. Um, you, these references to a system of higher education, that's a change of thinking in government and an important one. Um, and this acceptance that actually government should, did have a role in the funding of equipment, research, capital expenditure. So there were some key shifts that are happening there. Many of those things resonate throughout the 20th century. Yes, a lot of those things are not, you know, are not just some, something that's sort of forgotten about straight after the war. You know, many of those survive as issues even till, till today. So the war, I argue, had a very significant impact. Final slide, just out of interest. Uh, Fisher was the Fisher started the war as vice chancellor of the University of Sheffield. He ended the war as President of the Board of Education. Uh, but just look at some of that language. Uh, this was him writing the year after in 1919. Um, that the state has become conscious of the value of the university as an integral constituent of national power. Um, you know, and then, you know the, linking it very much with the state, the state which had crushed the Hindenburg line. Uh, and, and the importance of higher education for the state. Um, so, you know, that, you, you would not have got that sort of language before the war. Um, and the importance of the, of the universities within the sort of national consciousness, and how, you know, the, the university's got this sort of crucial role to play for the future. So, you know, the war, in my view, had a a major impact, uh, and it's sort of summed up by Fisher's comment there. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> Good stuff. Okay, questions? Yeah. Um, it's just interesting to me because uh, I've been 
on the research on the WEA. Mm -hmm. And the you know the university gives a very strong ties with yeah. the WEA. And though I'm doing the period after the First World War, it has struck me in the reading of them that the university and the WEA continue to work very closely during the First World War yes. in order to continue uh, providing working outside of people with some form of education. Um, and that must have been a pressure on the universities to follow through with that. Yeah. But they seem to have stuck to it. Have you, um, have you anything to comment on that? I, I would... I, not really, other than to agree with you that that you know the links between the universities, they weren't. Not every university had strong links with with WEA. Leeds did. Sheffield had very. If you do any work on Sheffield, Sheffield had very strong links with with WEA, and lots of academic staff at Sheffield were giving you know lectures uh, uh, for WEA. Uh, Sheffield buildings were used, um, you know, sort of free of charge almost by WEA. Uh, very strong links. Other universities less so. But but your basic point, I would certainly agree with. And you're right. It was maintained during the war. Now, I think. I I, I think that my own feeling is that what that reflected was that. Sometimes it was some of the older academic staff. In other words, some of the people who were not in it, in this, you know, basically called up or volunteer or then called up to, to fight. But certainly, if I'm if I'm using my Sheffield example, it was some some older staff who were very enthusiastic about WEA, who conti you know, who continued that work throughout the war. Um, but um, but yeah, you know, I, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. I, I think. Um, the links between universities and WEA were, were in the most part, strong. Um, I, I can think of certainly one university, which was Bristol, where they weren't strong. And in fact, there are some, some uh, th there's a view. Th the view of the WEA in some quarters, I don't know if you've found the same thing, there, there are some views change a bit after 1917. And that's because, and this was the case in Bristol, the WEA, WEA is in some way associated with the sort of what was going on in Russia and the workers' um, revolutionary activities. Now, I see no evidence for that, but, but that, was, that was an association in the minds of some people. Uh, but it, I'd see no, I found no evidence of it here in Leeds or in Sheffield or in Liverpool. Um, but there was there was certainly a little bit of that at Bristol. Well, I haven't come across that in, in the research I've done in the but I have heard that, that there was a perception of that the able to do that. Oh, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, then they also had the trial of the, the Central College, the, you know, the Labour College, yes. who we were yes. um, very red. But, uh, yes. yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I'm constantly yeah. over there. Certainly in... in Sheffield, it's seen as, you know, the university is actually quite proud of its links with the WEA as part of its extension activities and, and so on, and, and you know, it's a very it's seen in a very positive way. Jess? Um, the connection between the WEA and they they see a very strong responsibility they feel a very strong responsibility and that starts before the end of the war actually uh, you know they they start getting involved with running programs for injured servicemen who are coming back during the war as well as after it um, and they, they see that as, as a key responsibility At, towards the end of the war and then immediately after the war the government offers considerable extra funding to try and help with all of this as well um, so yes they, they, they this is important and 
you know, it, I didn't go into it tonight, but if you, if you do take the story forward a little bit, first of all, you see this dramatic increase in student numbers. So if, if you take those, some of those student numbers through to 1919, 1920, you often see student numbers in universities more than doubling in the space of one year. Now that takes quite a lot to handle. Uh, you know, working in a university, if suddenly you're facing double student numbers. And some of that is this, uh, it, that there are a number of pressures in 1919, so 1920. You've got the students who, you've got the people who've been fighting in the war who had started their studies and wanted to resume their studies. Then you've got new students who want to study. You've got this growth of interest in higher education which sort of means that there's now increasing demand. Um, and some of that goes back to some of the changes in education before the First World War, um, the growth of secondary education and so on. Uh, but you start seeing that developing. Um, and then, of course, there's another sort of challenge, phase, and that is the number of, of uh, ex-servicemen from imperial countries who are still in this country in 1919. Um, and universities lay on all sorts of programs for Australian soldiers, Indian soldiers, South African soldiers, and so on, who haven't yet gone back home. But in many cases, there just aren't the ships to take them home. Um, and so that's another burden that universities have to face uh, in that period. So, uh, yes, they're acutely aware of this need to try and help ex-servicemen, I think especially injured ex-servicemen, ex there's a lot about retraining. You know, how can some of these, these soldiers be given new careers? Um, Leeds is, is quite interesting because agriculture was seen as one of those areas. Um, mm -hmm. not, not so much the... Not, you know, not so much the sort of textiles and that sort of, but agriculture, which was big in this university at that time. Um, you know, that was seen as, a, as one of the sort of key areas for uh, ex-servicemen to, to work in. So it was a big area. Government tried to help. Government gave, gave extra funding. I'm not sure it was enough, but um, they, they certainly did try and, try and help. Do you have a question, please? Um, I was just wondering about when you speak about the increased government intervention into the universities as a result of this kind of new state consciousness and national idea. Do, do you see that in any other similar areas that you mentioned, social work and think of the rehabilitation, for example, as the kind of thing that we have? Yeah, well, I, th I think you know, another area that I didn't really go into, you, you certainly see. Um, you know, universities um, taking a more active role. Uh, it's very, you know, during the war, the universities within cities were, were quite high profile. So, you know, if, if I take Leeds for a moment, you know, students from the university were helping in the hospitals. They were doing all sorts of deliveries of things. They were going out into the fields to pick, you know, to harvest vegetables and fruit. Um, you had uh, the university playing this sort of bigger role bigger role like, with, with, within society um, and, uh, and certainly within in, in medicine um, you start seeing the universities beginning to, to I, think, I think take on a slightly more a slightly higher profile um, and certain things that had you know, dentistry is quite an interesting case there, were, there was some um, dentistry took on a sort of higher profile in the war partly because they found so many soldiers had got terrible teeth. Um, and, you know, that that was actually inhibited, you know, when they were you know, going out to the front in France or Belgium or something, if you had raging toothache, uh, you know, it wasn't a good thing to do. So they had, you know, they had to try and... Yeah, all sorts of, you know, it, all sorts of things like that. Um, and that, I think, begins to increase the... The profile. So certainly, universities that had dental schools, you know, those dental schools were very uh, actively involved in, in things like that. 
Um, another area where the universities played a, quite a big role, there were a lot of worries in the war about various diseases. Um, there were worries about plague. Um, and, you know, universities were often asked to sort of, you know, check on this and resolve this and try and reassure people that actually, you know, there, there, there were real worries uh, about bubonic plague. Um, and, you know, that the Germans might spread bubonic plague in some way. Um, you know, it, no evidence that that was actually, you know, necessarily true, but that but the universities played a role in trying to sort of, you know, sort of deal with some of this and put people's minds at rest. So I think, I think this increasing role in society is quite, is quite broadly based. Um, and what, what I think is quite interesting is I think, you know, I think sometimes there's a bit of an image that, um, for instance, things like, things like shell shock and so on, you know, were, were, you know, not really, not recognised. And the, Now, you know, I've certainly found lots of it, it, things, cases in universities where, you know, university medical departments were, as far as I can tell, genuinely, you know, concerned and trying to deal with these sort of things. And also, I mentioned it briefly, the growth of, of social work mm -hmm. as, a, as a subject and as a profession um, and much of that was because of these concerns, genuine concerns about the welfare of soldiers coming back or their families, you know, widows, orphan children, sort of thing. Um, and you know, I think the universities were you know, genuinely concerned about a lot of that. Um, yes. I was just going to say I was quite interested in your point about thinking about the future before the big battles. Yes. I find parallel in my own research with uh, how the Foreign Office in the Second World War were looking at how Europe would look in 1942 before a lot of the big battles happened. Yeah. 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 But my question was again, it was about legacy. Did the greater intervention or perceived desire for the government to be involved with influence? Does this impact on the recruitment and things like the civil service, which have been very much preserving lots of very educated people? Yeah. There were issues about recruitment to the civil service through the war. So there's an interesting exchange of correspondence with Oxford and Cambridge in 1915, where you get, um, you know, because basically, you know, Oxford and Cambridge lost lots of students uh, to, to fight in the, in the war. And there is concern that there aren't going to be enough people coming out of Oxford and Cambridge to fill those civil service places. And there are discussions about, you know, should we be opening this up for other universities? And if so, which other universities? Um, so, you know, and, and the answer is that they do open it up for, for other universities. My feeling, however, having looked at a bit at the sort of interwar period, is that some of the... And actually, there's a bit of a similarity with recruitment of women students. Right? There's a number of things which change a bit during the war and then revert quite quickly after the war. Um, and, and my impression, anyway, is that, as you say, it was sort of before the war, the preserve of Oxford and Cambridge. During the war, it opened up a bit, but very quickly reverted to being the preserve of Oxford and Cambridge. And, and just to sort of follow up my little point about recruitment of women, um, recruitment of w women into universities goes up a little bit in the war years. Um, as a proportion, of course, it goes up quite significantly. But as an actual numbers, it only, it doesn't go up hugely. Um, and then it drops again at the end of the war. Um, uh, and the proportion obviously drops dramatically when, when the, the men are sort of coming back in as, as well. Um, but there are some other interesting changes. You certainly, it's certainly a period of opening up of women into some of the, some of the actual uh, staff members. 
Um, and the other thing that changes a lot for, for women in the war are certain professions. Um, so, uh, whereas you know, universities had been accepting women uh, as doctors uh, before the war, this goes up uh, quite significantly. And certain, I've been doing some work about the veterinary profession. Now, veterinary profession um, before the war was staunchly all male. Then there's a crisis in the war years. Um, lots and lots of vets go to the front to, to work on the horses and the front. And there is a crisis as far as, you know, where are the vets to look after the cows and the sheep in the fields back home. Um, and the universities I keep saying to uh, the professional bodies, we, we want to take women. Uh, we want to have women vets. And the profession says, no, this is not a job for a woman. Um, but gradually, as the crisis bites, they change their mind. And so by the end of the war, the veterinary profession is opening up for women. Um, and that's not one that changes up. You know, it's open and it's opened up. Um, but, you know, there are some... There are some other cases, and I'd say Oxford and Cambridge exams and civil service is one of them, where some of the gains in the war are lost a bit soon after. There is a medium gap to the war. Or in the civil there's a discussion about who they let in and the examination process, and then that just kind of gets backtracked as the war goes on. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Good stuff. We have a final question. Um, I was interested in some of the parallels with other national um, types of organisation. Um, I've noticed that there's quite a few groups, um, power supply, transport, and other types of utility, but around about 1915, 16, they also are starting to have commissions looking into what are we going to do about this after the war. Mm. And it seems to follow a very similar struggle yeah. that 14, 15, they're struggling to survive. Yes. 15, or 16, 17, 18, for some, right, so we need some form of national organisation after yeah. the war. Yeah. But it seems like education and the university one is one of the few areas in which the plans that the government wants to carry out actually manage to go forward. So the transport they end up with, um, well, the Ministry of Transport, which ends up only just about barely control of the railway system. Mm. Um, power supply, they don't get nationalisation until after the Second World War. And most of the plans that they were going to talk about during the war itself fell through by the end of 1919. So I was wondering why you think that education was a special case. I think, I think one thing that's interesting is you know, you see, we, what happens. And actually they create this, the body, the, the UGC, the University Grants Committee. So what's interesting is I think the Board of Education, who had driven a lot of this change, but actually in the end gets sidelined a bit after the war, because the UGC becomes very much a treasury committee. Um, and, and, and I think you know, the, the UGC is able to sort of shape things quite, quite successfully. Um, now, I also think, now I don't know enough about some of those other areas of activity, but I do think that some of the people who were involved... Sir, Sir William McCormick, who became first chair of the UGC, who had been part of all those things during the war, I think was a very, very astute politician as well as a, somebody who, who genuinely had uh, the sort of best interests of the universities at heart. And I think, in some ways, some of the sort of, you know, some of the answer might actually lie in who, some of the individuals who were, who were involved in some of this. Um, and he managed to take the line, which the UGC for quite a few years managed to maintain, of actually um, being seen as the body that knew best. And Treasury, partly because it was a Treasury committee, but Treasury sort of accepted it without necessarily trying to interfere too much. Um, and, and I think that was quite a key part of it as, as well. So the sort of 
the, the, some of the structures that emerge and some of the individuals who are in those structures, I, I think, were quite important in taking forward higher education.